up to actually. Up there. It has. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good morning, folks. Perhaps we could take your seats. Thank you. Well, good morning, folks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And uh, we'll invite folks in the foyer as well if they would like to come in and join us at this point. You're very, very welcome to our family service here this morning in Scrabble Hall. And uh, if you're not in the habit of coming, we are really delighted to see you. If you're visiting and you're just here for today, the Lord can bless you and will bless you for coming for just one day. To the boys and girls and the young people here, it's so good to see you and to hear you. And your mummy is up there, isn't she? <laughs> yes, I'm good. We're delighted for the young people to be here. And young people, if you were in English, you might be asked to uh, create a sentence with good news and bad news in it. Well, here's one for you. The bad news is that you're going to be back to school in just over a week. And the good news is that your mums and dads will be jumping with joy. <laughs> so there's a sentence that you could use. But boys and girls and young people, we're delighted that you're with us here this morning. And we just pray that God will bless you for being here. And I know that last week was anxiety for some, and this week is anxiety for others with results. But the Lord has a plan for you. And even though at 16 or 18, you may not see it fully, he has a plan for your life. And it doesn't depend just on results. It depends on serving him and giving yourself over to him. So please remember that as you are looking for results. So what's happening here this morning? Well, we're going to have some pieces of praise, and then we're going to have a video uh, for Kids Zone, followed by a last piece of praise. And at that point, Ian will uh, discharge the children to the various activities. Our speaker this morning is Robert Hamilton. Robert is an elder here in Scrabble that you may well know. And uh, we'd just like to thank Robert as well from the church here for the amount of prayerful effort and consideration that he puts into preparing a message from God for us this morning. And we thank you, Robert. Announcements for the rest of the week. Um, basically, this evening service at 6.30 is a testimony meeting where a gentleman will tell how God has moved and worked in his life. And this gentleman, I have to say, faced one of the most harrowing experiences that any person, particularly any parent, could face. And the abduction and the loss 
of a lovely nine-year-old girl. It was way back in the early 1980s, 81, I think. But God moved in his life afterwards. And it would be interesting to hear this evening how he came to faith in the Lord Jesus and how God has worked in his life. So that's um, this evening at 6.30. And then looking forward to two weeks' time, God willing, there will be a church family lunch. Uh, family from Italy, the Zucchettos, are coming home on Tuesday. And uh, the church thought it would be a good idea if we could have a lunch where everybody would have an opportunity to speak to them and to share with them and vice versa. So that will be on Sunday the 3rd after our morning service. So they are the announcements. I'm now going to pray and hand over to Ian. So let's just pray. Father, we thank you this morning that we're not here by accident. We're here because of your divine plan for our lives. And we thank you that your plan is to bless us and not to harm us. It is to save us. It is to give us a living relationship with you. We thank you that you paid the price for that when you gave the Lord Jesus to die on the cross. And we thank you for his mercy and grace toward us and being willing to do it, that uh, we might have peace, we might have hope, and we might have a future. So we pray this morning, Father, for your presence with us, and we pray that um, the message will sink into all of our hearts and we will be doers and not only listeners of what we hear this morning. Bless the praise band now as they lift their praises along with us to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Dennis. So we're going to do two songs before the video. Um, one we hadn't done for a while, but I hear the kids were enjoying it a lot at Kids Zone this week. So we're going to stand and sing My Lighthouse. Let's all stand. My wrestling and in my doubts and in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea and in the silence you won't let go in my questions your truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh you are the peace in my troubled sea and my lighthouse and my lighthouse shining in the darkness i will follow you oh my lighthouse and my lighthouse and i will trust the promise you will carry me safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore I won't fear what tomorrow brings With each morning I rise and sing My God's love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea oh, You are the peace in my troubled sea And my lighthouse and my lighthouse shining in the darkness and i will follow you oh my lighthouse and my lighthouse and i will trust the promise you will carry me safe to shore safe to shore
shining in the darkness, and I will follow you all. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, and I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Stand, feet, stand on your feet if you can, please. And uh, we're going to sing, uh, When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on, more than conquerors. And when my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. But you are the light, you are the spirit that's in my soul. Oh, your resurrection bar burns like fire in my heart. Oh, when waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We
looks like a rather fun week. <laughs> uh, so um, we're just going to sing a last song here, and as we sing this here, the kids are going to go out to um, some, not Sunday school, what is it? <laughs> kids Quest. <laughs> I thought I started back. That's good, right? That's good. Caroline's here to help me out because I'm pretty useless. Anyway, that'd be great. So yeah, so the kids go out and Jeremy will sing this song. That'd be great. Thank you very much.
Good morning. So thanks to Ian and the band for leading us in praise. Some really helpful songs there to lead us into what we're going to be thinking about this morning. There is life beyond the grave. We're looking at the subject of death defeated. And it's actually quite relevant to what we're going to be looking at this evening. Dennis has already mentioned this, uh, about the testimony of Andy Cardy. Um, some of you will remember this incident back in the 1980s. Most of you won't, but it, it did cause quite a bit of shock right across the province, the death of this little girl, Jennifer Cardy. And her mother, Patricia, who has since passed away herself, later wrote this book, There Came a Day. And she talks about that very candidly, very openly. And that's certainly a book that's interesting and well worth the read. Some of you may have already read it. Uh, it, it also came up actually this month. Uh, I just happened to come across it, flicking channels. Uh, the Child Snatcher was on Channel 5 earlier this month. Uh, and I, I presume you can get, you can still get it, uh, rewind it or whatever. It's not iPlayer, but whatever Channel 5 is equivalent of if it is. Uh, so it, it's worth looking at because it gives a heads up in the story. It's actually the story of Robert Black, the murderer who, who killed that little girl, Jennifer Carter. He was only convicted uh, just over a decade ago. It was a, like a 30 year gap between the crime and his conviction. And in the meantime, he had been convicted of three similar murders in England. <laughs> And uh, suspected of, of other similar ones that he was never convicted of. He has since died as well. I think he died in 2016. So uh, although it happened such a long time ago, it's still very current. And uh, from the point of view, it's still in people's minds. And even if you weren't familiar with the case at the time, I think you'll find Andy's testimony this evening worth listening to. Patricia, the mother of the little girl, was a Christian before Jennifer was murdered. But Andy wasn't. He came to faith subsequently. <coughs> And he will talk about that a little bit this evening. Of course, the loss of a child in whatever circumstances is absolutely tragic. Uh, just the thought of it even, I think, creates panic in our hearts. Uh, it's just such a terrible thing. And I, I was very much aware of this even in my preparations for today's message, thinking of, of that old girl, Scarlett Rossborough, who died tragically in an outing from Lauren to Carrick about 10 days ago. I was just buried last week, uh, eight year old, just taken quickly, and it, it, just, it just pierces our heart, doesn't it? And the Bible passage that we're going to be considering today speaks of the death of a little 12 year old girl, not at the hands of a murderer, not as a result obviously of a road traffic accident, but a victim of some illness. We're not made aware from the text what that was, but either way, of course, tragic. And death of itself is terrible. We rebel against it. We never get used to it. Um, and just yesterday, some of us were at the, the funeral of uh, a man called Walter McConkie. He was the father of one of the brothers here from the church. An 86-year-old, a life well lived. And yet it hurts. And we rebel against it. And we feel every time this isn't right. So in a sense, whether it's a child or whether it's a man who's lived his whole life, there's still something within the human heart that laments and says, this isn't right. And you know, that's, it's proper and just that we feel like that because we weren't designed for death. We weren't designed for it. We were designed for life and eternal life at that. And that's why there's something within us that rebels against us. We just know what's not right. And so in a sense, it's actually a healthy sign because it shows something of the fact that we were wired for eternity. And we know that. We know that in our hearts. And so when death hits, and of course it hits every family sooner or later, that's why it hurts us so much because we know fine rightly this is not what we were designed for. The title for today's message, if you follow in the church diary or if you follow our programs on social media or whatever, is Death Defeated. And I can, I can hear folks say, if only that were possible. If only it was possible for this to happen. And I think to help us to understand this, we need to try to get a handle on, on Jesus' perspective on death on God's outlook on death, his perspective, not ours. 
You know, the Bible describes death as the last enemy, the ultimate enemy. And it is an enemy of every single human being. And some of you here sitting this morning, and some of you listening online, will immediately be thinking of those deaths of dear ones that have rocked our lives forever. It's an enemy, and each of us are going towards that enemy if the Lord doesn't return first. As we go to our narrative this morning, and as you listen to this reading, you will notice that it's, it's sort of two incidents wrapped up in one. We'll be concentrating on, on the raising of Jairus' daughter, this little girl of 12-year-old that died, but I'll also be making passing reference to the healing of a woman with a, with a bleeding issue. I suppose in today's terms we would say that she had a very serious gynae problem. But in a sense, the two stories are related because they have certain commonalities in and around the call to faith. Now, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you'll remember the incident when Jesus and the disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee and a storm blew up, a very um, harsh storm, very robust storm, so much so that even the disciples, some of them experienced fishermen, were afraid that they were going to drown. And Jesus, in the meantime, sleeping in the boat, they waken him. He says those famous words, peace be still. The, the, the storm calms. And then you'll remember the very next thing that Jesus says to the disciples. Where is your faith? That's the question that he asks. They were in the face of death. And the question he asks them is, where is your faith? And it looks as if Luke, the author of this gospel that we're going through, and remember, he's doing a very clear analytical study of the life of Jesus and the impact that it has. It's as if he's now saying, right, Jesus was asking that question, where is your faith? And now he highlights a couple of incidents where he's pointing us to where we should put our faith, or maybe better still, in whom we should put our faith. So after, ask, after Jesus asking the question, where is your faith? Then we've got the author saying, right, where are you going to actually put your faith? You as an individual, in the storms that will come into your life. And so we have these two incidents, which are storms in people's lives, and the same question sort of raises itself. Okay, where's your faith when all this is going on? So Adam's going to come and read the passage for us just now from Luke chapter 8, verses 43 to 56. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about twelve, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them <clears throat> to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. And that is the, the gospel of God. That is the good news of God. Let us pray. Lord, in the face of death, where can we go? And as we look at this incident from your word this morning, Grow in us, Lord, the conviction that you are the defeater of death, that you are the resurrector, that you are the giver of life, both physical and eternal. 
And strange as it might seem, Lord, we take comfort from the words of committal that we often hear at Christian funerals, that the Lord Jesus Christ who died and was buried and rose again for us can change our mortal bodies so that they may be like his glorious body, according to the mighty working by which he is able to subdue all things, including death, to himself. Amen. So we consider this narrative this morning. I want to look at it from two angles. First of all, if we can view it from the, the human aspect, the emotions that are going on here. These are real difficulties in the life of real people. So I want us to be thinking, what were their attitudes? What was going on in their heart and mind as they went through these storms in their own personal life? And then a sort of slight shift from that and be looking at the divine or the spiritual aspect, the, the spiritual dimension of what was going on. Because these are essentially two stories about faith in God. My prayers this morning that would inspire us in our faith. If you've already come to faith, that it would strengthen your faith. If you haven't already come to faith, that you would come to faith. So as we think about the human aspects here, the human emotions... The text basically introduces, as as you will have heard as Adam read it, to two contrasting human protagonists. First of all, we've got a man of a certain social and religious standing. We get his name, Jairus. We get his title. He's a ruler of the synagogue. And then, secondly, we get an unnamed woman. We don't even get her name. And, of course, in biblical times, women... Females would have just been considered second-class citizens. And so, in a sense, it's not surprising that that's the way she's presented here. So you've got this guy, Jairus, you get his name, you get his title, and then you get an unnamed woman. Financially destitute at that. Mark's Gospel tells us that she had spent all her money on doctors trying to obtain healing for her condition. So, in a sense, she couldn't get two more contrasting people. Jairus, his name actually means whom God enlightens. That tells you maybe something about him, his spiritual understanding and how he was considered. And he had this position as ruler of the synagogue. Now, as I understand it, that was a lay position, but he would have been very much seen as a sort of, as a top man in the synagogue. He would have been highly respected in the Jewish culture of that time. He would have been responsible for conducting services in the synagogue, for selecting participants, for ensuring that the building, building was kept in order, overall supervisor, if you like. And so that brought with it a certain status in the local Jewish community. Yet his heart was breaking. He had an only daughter, and she was seriously ill. So all the social status in the world, all the position, all the the good name that he had, it didn't change the difficulty of human suffering in his life. And then you have this other poor, unnamed woman with a long-standing personal health issue. And it would have carried a degree of shame, as you can imagine. Uh, not only physically, but even from a, from a biblical point of view in that context. Way back in the book of Levit- Leviticus, it says that whenever a woman has her menstrual period, she will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. But that same chapter goes on to say, if a woman has a flow of blood for many days that is unrelated to her menstrual period, or if the blood continues beyond the normal period, she is ceremonially unclean. This lady was living in this unclean condition for 12 years. She would have been at an absolute end of herself. So you've got this fine, religious, upstanding person, Jairus, And then you have this poor woman that just felt nothing but shame and embarrassment. But what I want you to notice, and I think this is very significant, was the attitude with which both of them came to the Lord Jesus. Verse 41, talking of Jairus, says, The synagogue leader came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him. And later on down the chapter, in verse 47, it says, The woman came trembling and fell at his feet. Both of them, despite their different social positions, both of them came to Jesus 
humbly acknowledging their need of him and submitting to his lordship. And they even showed that with their body language. You know, it doesn't matter who you are or what your background is or what your academic record is or what your job is or where you live or what car you drive. We all need to come to Jesus, bow at his feet and acknowledge, Lord, I need you to transform my life. And you know what? You know something? My experience in the Christian life has shown us that is one of the most difficult things for us as human beings. Because we're proud. And to get to the point where you say, you know what? I can't do this. I'm a broken sinner. And I can't fix myself. This guy, Jairus, he was a fixer. He even fixed up the synagogue. That was part of his job. But even him, just like the poor woman with no money, poor health, and a stigma attached to her that caused her great embarrassment, both of them had to get to that point where they said, I need Jesus to sort this. Have you ever got there? Have you ever had the humility just to come and say, you know what? No matter how hard I try in life, no matter how many times I turn over a new leaf, I can't fix this broken thing within me. I acknowledge, Lord, I'm a broken sinner. Please intervene and transform my life. You need to get there. Both of these folk got to this point. Let me sort of switch the camera now onto the faith aspect, the responses that come from their encounters with Jesus. With a poor lady, the ill lady, we see an attitude of faith that I think the text implies that actually surprised Christ himself. Mark tells us that her motivation for touching the edge of his cloak was that she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She thought, I'm a woman. I've got this problem. There's a stigma attached to it. Everybody knows. There's no way Jesus is going to enter, entertain having a conversation with me. But if I can only get close enough, if I can only manage to touch the hem the edge of his garment, who knows, I might get healed. So despite the crush, she presses in and touched the edge of his cloak. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. Immediately, she was healed. The power of Jesus to transform lives, even in an instant, sometimes it doesn't like, happen like that, sometimes it's a process, but there are times when it just people's lives just radically changed by the Lord Jesus. And he can still do that. And he still does do that. Even last Sunday night as we listened to Brand Madden's testimony. He had that sort of Damascus Road experience driving down the M2 or the M5. Was it coming from Carrick anyway? And he had been at his mate's house in Carrick who, who wasn't going on as a Christian at all. But he had challenged Brian about his life. And Brian, sitting in the passenger seat of his car, going down the M5, got to the point where he said, Lord, I can't sort this. I'm a sinner. Please come in and save me. His life was transformed. God does that. Jesus attributes this, in the woman's case, to her faith. Verse 48. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You see, faith is the vehicle whereby we come to life transformation. It's Jesus that saves us. It's God that intervenes and rescues us. But the vehicle that gets us there is the step of faith that we take. In other words, this requires a response from our hearts. It's not a passive thing. It's not something you wake up someday and it just happens to you. It's exercising faith in Jesus. You know what that means? It basically means taking God at his word when he promises something. Can you take God at his word? That's what it's about. That is the bottom line. We were thinking of this verse in our first service this morning. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Do you remember Jesus' question to the disciples in the boat? Where's your faith? And then there's this woman, she's in a storm, 
She reaches out, begs Jesus to intervene in her life, touches his garment, and what happens? By faith, she, her life is transformed. Have you ever got to that point of exercising faith, taking God at his word? What about Jairus, the synagogue ruler with a very ill daughter? Well, due to the delay in this incident with a sick woman, news arrives to Jairus, as we've heard, to tell him not to bother Jesus anymore because, unfortunately, his daughter has already died. The words that Jesus said to Jairus then in verse 50 are very powerful. Now, bear in mind that he has just told the sick woman, Jesus just told the sick woman, your faith has healed you. He now goes on to challenge Jairus to have that same attitude of faith. He says to Jairus, as soon as the news comes through that the wee girl's dead, he says, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe, and she'll be healed. You see what's happening there? He said, look, this woman, has, her faith has healed her. Jairus, it's your turn. Just believe. This Jesus, who brings peace to the woman who was in turmoil for 12 years. The text actually says that because it's, Jesus said to her, your faith has healed you, go in peace. I think it echoes the words that Jesus said in the storm in the boat to the waves, peace be still. And here in this woman's storm, Jesus says, you know what? You have it, faith. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now Jesus promises healing in what seems like a lost cause situation. I mean, the wee girl was dead. If ever there was a lost cause, this was it. Do you ever find yourself thinking, I'm a bit of a lost cause. There's no way I'm ever going to get there faith-wise. Or a situation that you're in in life is a lost cause. Maybe something you've been praying for for years. It doesn't seem to move. You begin to think, this is an absolute lost cause. This was a lost cause situation. And we have in the midst of this, this remarkable phrase from Jesus in verse 52. She's not dead, but asleep. And of course, that provokes laughter and derision from the gathered mourners. Now, do you understand what Jesus is saying here? I think we need to come back to what I mentioned briefly at the start. That is Jesus' perspective on death. It's completely different from ours. Let me illustrate that with two other passages from the Gospels very quickly. There's an incident in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus is sending out the disciples in mission. And he's telling them that as they go out, there's a threat that they might be martyred, okay? And part of, and part of that, he says this to them. This, sorry, he says this to them. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So with this threat of martyrdom, if you like, of losing their physical life, Jesus says, you don't need to actually be afraid of the death of the body, physical death but rather fear spiritual death. The Bible calls that the second death. That means to be cut off for God forever. Jesus says that's what people need to be worried about. It's not so much physical death. Whether we're physically or alive or dead changes nothing in terms of our standing with the Lord, which is based on the spiritual rather than the physical. See, we base so much in the physical of this life, what we can see, what we have, what we do. But for God, it's what's happening in our soul that counts. That's why later on in the New Testament, you'll have words like this, which seem, which are amazing and perhaps somewhat surprising. Paul's writing to Christians. He says, you know what? If we live, we'll live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now, with that, I don't want to in any way make light of the pain and agony of physical death when we lose a loved one. But there is a spiritual perspective to this. And Paul's saying that to the Roman Christians. He's saying, brothers and sisters, if we live, let's live to the Lord. And if, we're, if we die, we actually die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. In other words, it doesn't change our spiritual standing. Let me draw attention to another passage. This is in John's Gospel. So there's a dear friend of Jesus, Lazarus, who's just physically died, okay? His sisters are mourning. And this is what Jesus says to one of the sisters. Bear in mind, this guy, Lazarus, just passed away. 
Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? What an affirmation. What a question. Here, what's your, what's your answer to that question? Do you believe it? You know, if you believe this, it changes everything. Absolutely everything. The person who has believed, placed their faith in Jesus, taken God at, at his word for their soul salvation, even though they might physically die, which they will, it'll happen to all of us sooner or later if the Lord doesn't return first, but they won't actually die and live forever. Didn't they tell you that Jesus had a different perspective on, on life and death? What a hope that is for us. That's a hope for all of us here this morning. If you've placed your faith in Christ, this is a rock that you can rely on. If you haven't yet got to that point, if you do place your faith in Christ, you will live forever according to the words of Jesus, the way we were designed to live. You may have heard the quote that was attributed to Billy Graham just before his passing five years ago. There's actually some doubt in terms of was it a Billy Graham quote or was Billy Graham quoting D.L. Moody? Either way, it's valid. But it goes like this. Someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I shall be more alive than I am now. That's the essence of what we're talking about here this morning. That's what I meant when I prayed at the start of the message this morning, saying that Jesus is the defeater of death. Jesus is the resurrector. Jesus is the giver of life in the absolute and eternal sense of the word. Amen. I want us to close by singing a hymn this morning. It's an older hymn. You can indulge me with that one. But it's, uh, it, start, it starts off, I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. But the chorus of this hymn is taken from the words of 2 Timothy 1, chapter 12. The chorus goes like this. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I hope that each of us, each of us in this room this morning, can sing this convic with conviction. Paul wrote these letters, or wrote the letter to 2 Timothy when he was in death row. He was about to die, and he knew it. And he pens these words, I am persuaded, I am convinced that what I have entrusted to him, he is able to keep until that day. Amen? Let's stand and really sing this hymn with conviction. Thanks, Ian. <clears throat> Not why God's wondrous grace to me has been made known, or why unworthy as I am, they came before Him.
Father God, what a great promise that we have, that we know in whom we have believed. And we're persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have entrusted to him for that day. Lord, may that be the experience of each of us here this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you rose from the dead and that your word describes you as being the first fruits of those who will rise from the dead. So thank you for that eternal living hope that we have in Christ. Christ, the resurrector. Christ, the giver of life. Christ, the giver of eternal life. It's in his name that we pray and commit ourselves to you. Amen. Please be seated. If any of you want to have a chat around this or, or talk about it, or indeed you've prayed this prayer of faith this morning, want a conversation, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you about that. Or indeed, even the person that maybe you came along with this morning, you might want to just engage with them about it. But do take to heart the promises of God. That's what faith is, taking God at his word. May God help us to do that. Amen.